Okay, guys, thanks so much for being here this week. We have a very special guest. This man, I guess the best way I could describe him is the man behind the money. This guy knows where all of the financial bodies are buried, and in a lot of cases, he probably helped bury them. Please welcome this week's special guest, Power Move maker, Mr. Derek Ferguson. Defer. Again, thanks for um, coming out today, guys. This is a really good friend, knowing Derek over 20 plus years. Um, Derek, you're a different guest than we normally have because you are literally the man behind the money. So why don't you take us back? And, and this interview for me is near and dear to my heart because I am from the Boogie Down Bronx and I know you are as well. Yes. Tell me about your upbringing really quick. Great, uh, first I gotta, Shout out to Sean Prez, uh, one of my favorite people in the world. Um, and, you know, we did work together starting 20 years ago. One of the things that re is, that's really important to know about Sean Prez from the day I started working with him at Bad Boy Records, the job he was given, he did excellently. And then he went on to the next job. Then he went on to run his own company. And he's just such a great model of do the job you're doing excellently, excel, and ascend. And uh, I applaud him. Uh, Thank you, you know, I, Thank I you still so learn from that. him today. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah. so uh, the Bronx, yeah, I, my, my, um, I ended up in the Bronx actually uh, before the age of one. Uh, my house burned down in Yonkers. Okay. Uh, my parents lived in Yonkers and uh, they moved us to the Bronx. Uh, we lived in like a new development, it was like private houses. Um, and, um, you know, the Bronx for me felt different than it's described because my neighborhood was very much like a neighborhood. Uh, my parents are both from uh, the South. Uh, so, you know, the, you know, just living in New York was a new thing for them. And, you know, the way they raised us and the way our neighborhood felt, it just, it, I, it could have been anywhere. It could have been, you know, uh, Mulberry or <laughs> any, any, any neighborhood. So it felt, really like just, you know, just any regular neighborhood. I felt, you know, loved, nurtured. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me, I guess the main theme in my life as a young person was just that my parents instilled so much confidence in me. Okay. Like from uh, my first days of going to school, like even before going to school, they just instilled in, in me that there was something special about me. Uh, and I always just felt that, like I, for whatever reason, I believed it, right? So I just remember showing up in school and just knowing I was gonna do well, knowing I was gonna excel. I didn't, you know, not in like an arrogant way, but just in a way that they told me it, so, you know, it was gonna happen. Um, and, you know, it was that type of, uh, you know, that type of belief that they had in me, I think that really drove me. Um, you know, the context of living in the Bronx versus what the rest of the world looks like doesn't really mean much mm -hmm. until you start seeing the rest of the world. Uh -huh. So um, for me, I don't think I really understood, you know, you know all of the uh, pluses and minuses of the Bronx until I, until I started seeing more of the world. Um, so, you know, the Bronx is such a special place for me because it's really where a lot of uh, my... Um, you know, characteristics that I developed till this day, you know, were developed there. Um, my, uh, my neighborhood was, um, again, you know, uh, a lot of private houses, a lot of, you know, good family people, but my father also owned a business. Okay. So in our neighborhood, um, you know, he employed like a lot of people in the neighborhood. What type of business? Uh, he owned a trucking business. Okay. Uh, and, you know, his father had a trucking business in Virginia. He had a trucking business. A lot of his brothers had trucking businesses. So very entrepreneurial family. Um, and, you know, what was unique about that is that, you know, um, I immediately, you know, at the age of 10, 11, was working for him, basically. So, uh, and most of my good friends in the neighborhood, their first jobs were with my father. Nice. Uh, nice. So he was the employer in the neighborhood. He was the boss. 
And that's just what I saw and what I observed. And I think that kind of shaped a lot of, uh, you know, who I was going to be uh, as I grew up. So entrepreneurship, it is pretty much in your DNA since your dad and his dad and your uncles all own businesses. Yes. Wow. Wow. Um, coming up in the Bronx, you're from the Soundview area, correct? Yes. Okay, so you, I mean, you are coming up at the birth of hip hop, am I not yes, right? Yes, absolutely. What did that mean to a young Derek Ferguson? Yeah, so you know, as you know, if you're in if you're in the Bronx, like that, just was a part of uh, of, of everyday life. Right? Correct. So you go to the lunchroom. For me, when I was in starting probably in sixth grade, fifth grade even, like you go to the lunchroom and. People are off in the corner playing jam on the groove. And back then it started with just a lot of people just break dancing. Mm -hmm. So you'd hear jam on the groove, like for all lunch period, an hour long, and people break dancing. And that was like your lunch period. And then it went, and then it moved to like, you know, people rapping, rhyming on tapes. The tapes were the biggest thing. Uh, you know, who had a flash tape? People would have flash tapes that were copied like 10 times over so you could barely make out what was going on. You could hear like the, uh, the, you know, the scratch, barely hear the scratch, <laughs> barely make out the words. Uh, but it was, a, it, was a, it was just a fabric of what we experienced growing up. And in my household, again, uh, my brother was four years older than me and he was working for my dad as well. Mm -hmm. So at an early age, you know, he was making good money. Like he was really my father's lead mechanic. So by 14, he was probably making four or five hundred dollars a week, so wow. so he so he like soon as you know as hip hop was growing, he went and bought like equipment day one. So we had equipment in my house, uh, you know, two nice turntables, a mixer, speakers. Yeah, at, at a young age, by the time I was in you know probably seventh grade, we had full equipment in my house. And if you know the Bronx, the house that has the equipment has That's the line right. of people go. <laughs> waiting to Correct. get on to get their turn on, on like <laughs> guys would be sitting around my house for like five hours like <laughs> just to get that three minutes on the turntables. Uh, but that was my house. And, you know, not only did my brother have the, uh, the, the equipment, but we had Harmony Records right there in Parkchester that had all the yep, big beats. Absolutely. So he but he would come back like my cousins and stuff would save up for one you know, one, uh, one, two, you know, one set of albums to, to mix. He'd come back with like 30 albums or 30 uh, 45s or 12 inches to mix and we would just be going at it. So that was very much a fa fabric. I learned to DJ at an early age, you know, I DJ parties in high school and college. And you know, I, I made I made a lot of money on the side DJ. Nice. You probably nice. never knew that, did you? No. I actually yeah, DJ'd a bad new. boy party. You, you don't even know that. <laughs> James Cruz was like, D, I gotta step out. He was DJ. He's like, I gotta step out. Can you handle the wheels of steel for a couple of Are minutes? Are you serious? Absolutely. Oh my god. Absolutely. Goodness. That's in that's in the annals. You can ask James. Okay, so you can ask James that one. <laughs> you just bought something new. <laughs> learned something new about you. So you talked about um, DJing in school, and and I just want to fast forward for a minute because this is where your story for me gets so inspiring and impressive. Um, Wharton Business School at UPenn. How does a young man from the, now I'm from the Bronx, mm -hmm. you know, most people in the inner city, most young men and women in the inner city, we're not necessarily, yes, we're groomed to go to college, but Wharton Business, that's something different. Congratulations on that. How did you end up there and were you always good with numbers and finances? Is this something you knew from an early age? Yeah. So uh, again, I go back to my parents. Neither one of them graduated from college, but they were very academically oriented. Um, so I used to go work for my dad, and basically the, the job was mechanics on the weekend. Okay. And I was basically two, whatever, four thumbs, whatever. <laughs> I was like not good at doing the mechanical stuff, so he put me in the office. So around 11 or 12, I started really keeping his books. So I immediately, I always loved numbers, but I just loved that I love like keeping his books, figuring out how much money he made that week, how much money came in, how much money came out, what did he make. So, so even as a young man, and I'm sorry to cut you yeah. off, as a young man, this is something that just interests you. Absolutely, really? and, I, and I just always loved and was really good at math. My uh, academic success, again, you know, largely driven by confidence my parents gave me, my, my brother and sister and family support. Um, you know, I went to public schools in the Bronx, but I got skipped uh, from the third grade to the fourth grade 
Uh, and then also got skipped in a program that was a um, SP program. So I did seventh, eighth, and ninth grade in two years. So I, uh, I graduated high school at 16. Wow. And went to UPenn Wharton School at 16. So all that to say, I didn't know much about college choices. When I was, you know, this is, you know, I'm 16, I'm getting ready to go to college, and I'm honestly just thinking about where can I play ball? <laughs> you know, like, like, I'm like, where am I going to be able to make the team? So I'm sending films on my own to like Boston College, all these schools I could never play at. And, um, you know, um, and a friend of mine um, who graduated the year before me, um, I went to Stuyvesant High School. A friend okay. of mine graduated the year before me, went to UPenn, was telling me about the business program there. So I applied, um, did not really knowing about Wharton, not really knowing it's like the best business school in the country. Um, and, um, you know, I got into, uh, a lot of different schools, but I got into Penn, Syracuse, Boston College, and I remember uh, having a good conversation with the Boston College coach. Uh, my sister was going to Syracuse, so I was really, UPenn was kind of like an afterthought, like, mm -hmm. mm, maybe I'll go there, uh, and then ultimately I decided to go there, largely because they gave me the best financial aid package. So I show up on campus, and honestly, I'm just learning about what I'm really stepping into when I show up as, 16 year, as a 16-year-old on this campus and realizing, you know, this is, you know, some, you know, just in, you know, number one business school in the country. I'm seeing, like, the competition that I'm going to be <laughs> dealing with. And uh, honestly, um, it was, I, I wasn't, I, I can't say <laughs> that I selected that based on the right information and did it the right way, but, you know, I ended up there and basically had to adapt. Now, congratulations, congratulations. And your story gets even, even more interesting. From Wharton, you attend Harvard. Walk us through that for a second. Yeah, so at Wharton, I majored in accounting. So okay. I stayed, my love of accounting uh, continued. Majored in accounting, uh, loved it. Like, I never had any issues with any classes that had numbers in them. So that was a real big help. Um, so, you know, I performed well at school and, you know, um, it definitely did well in all of my you know, accounting finance classes. Uh, coming out of school, I went to work for a CPA firm, uh, Coopers and Library, mm -hmm. got my CPA. Uh, so all was kind of lining up. Um, but uh, after a couple of years uh, in the accounting field, I, one, I learned a lot, I learned a lot about business. But you know, for me, I always, because my father was in business and I was seeing businesses around me, I always yearned to know more about you know, what makes one person or one company successful in business while another one fails. So what really differentiates business success from business failure? So uh, I really, you know, that was something I really wanted to know more about and to um, uh, just you know, learn more about and to, and to really kind of come up with the formula. Um, so at the time, also in New York City, um, as I was uh, entering into my um, uh, second year at, at Cooper's and Library, and a group of friends of mine and I, I, I uh, started a magazine. Okay. The uh, name of it was Urban Profile Magazine. Um, this magazine, this is right during the time of the Bernie Getz shooting. What year is this? The this is uh, 1987. Okay. Uh, so this is the Bernie Getz shooting. For those who don't know, it's kind of like preceded Central Park Five. It was a guy on a subway, three young African, African American men approach him. He just takes out his gun and shoots them. Uh, he goes to trial and he gets off, basically. So. New Yorkers were talking about it, um, and at the time, there's no internet, there's no way to really voice your opinion about anything. And we were all sitting around, kind of having a living room conversation, and we were like, man, like our voice just, you know, can't get heard. Like, how are we going to get our voice heard? Um, and at the time, a good friend of mine, Keith Klingscales, was very handy with technology. He, had, he was the first one we knew that had a Mac, and he was like, we should do a magazine. And literally that night, we started, he started laying out a magazine. We started pulling together articles. And about three months later, we had a magazine. It was that simple? Pretty much that simple. Really? That simple. We all like pitched in. At that time, it was like $200 each. And we were off and running. A lot of things fell into place. Went to the printer. The guy at the printer was like, um, hey, I just happen to have extra paper. So you don't have to pay for the paper. <laughs> so our first issue, you know, we... we 
we uh, printed it for barely anything, and we still didn't really have en enough money, so we did what anybody does when they're trying to raise money, we threw a big party. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, at the time, the party was great. We signed up like over 1,000 subscribers at that party, and we launched a magazine with close to like 10,000 subscribers. Are you serious? Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So doing that again, and really becoming more and more interested in business and thinking about now I'm thinking about how do I, um, you know, how do I evolve into big business? Like how do I think about all the things my peers from Wharton are going to do, you know, all the things I'm reading about in the Wall Street Journal. How do I really, you know, how do I set myself up to be in a position to do that? And that's when the opportunity to, uh, you know, apply to Harvard Business School. I was kind of against it because of the money I was going to spend to go there. Um, but I just felt like it was going to be a nice step and would be a great place to learn more about my ultimate question, which is how, how, how can you be successful in business, especially versus other competitors? Okay, so because I actually thought you went straight from Wharton to Harvard. So there was a right, time where you got, went yeah. to the real world, you start your own, mag you work for Coopers, you start your own magazine, and then you go back to Harvard. Yes. Okay, so what does Harvard teach you that you didn't learn at Coopers? And even more so, now you have real world experience in business. How were you able to take what you knew from business, you know, your own real world experience and um, apply it to what you were learning at Harvard? Yeah, so I wanna just say a few things about this. Uh, one is, you know, I, when I observed my father and how he ran his business, um, and this is something that's really, to me, important about our society today, entrepreneurship is a great equalizer. Mm -hmm. Like he was a great entrepreneur and he had a high school diploma, right? So I learned every day from him like how to run a business and what that meant in reality. And it was interesting because, you know, going to Harvard Business School was going to learn more of the academic side of it, but I felt like I had seen the real life and I also knew that just because I go get this degree doesn't mean I'm gonna be a great business person because I've seen people that didn't have the degree that were great business people. Uh, the second thing, just a little aside, which is to talk about how entrepreneurial my family was. I remember a conversation when I first got into the Harvard Business School with my grandfather, who, as I said, was a lifelong entrepreneur. And I was talking to him like, you know, Grandpa, I got accepted. I'm going to, going to Harvard, you know, to study business. And, you know, he was kind of like confused. He was like, uh, you know, I think he was like, what does this mean? I thought you already graduated from college. <laughs> what, is, what does all this mean? And uh, he just looked at me and says, okay, all right. He says, well, don't go get all that education and go work for anybody, <laughs> you know? Nice. So like, that's how, that's how it was just instilled in me and how, how much it was just part of our DNA to be entrepreneurs. But Harvard Business School is a whole, you talk about Wharton being a whole nother world. I was able to at Wharton kind of, you know, still stick tight with my core, you know, crew, crew of friends and you know, just uh, it's a big campus, so you can just kind of, you know, create your own su support groups and survive there. Uh, but Harvard is like, you know, you are thrust into a, an environment where you have to interact significantly uh, with your classmates. Um, it's a section environment, so you're in sections of 80 to 90 people. Okay. You get you all your classes you have in your first year with the same section of people, so you get to know them really well. You're doing all kind of group projects with them. Um, and uh, just to give you a flavor for what it feels like, <laughs> you know, the day one, you know, I sit in my seat, they're about, you know, it's a, just, a, just a real diverse group of people in the classroom. And, you know, when you, enter, when you start the class, they call it opening the case, right? So my first class, never forget it, Melvin Menendez was a professor, and the case was a Procter & Gamble case about consumer products. So you have to open the case, which means somebody's got to start off the conversation about this case. So you read about a 15, 20 page thing about the company, some issue they're facing, and then you have to open the case. Opening the case is where there's the most pressure because you have to basically lay out all the issues. So he calls on a guy, Paul Stoneham, <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, the way he ripped through this case was like, I was almost like ready to just call and drop out. I was like, there's no way <laughs> I could compete with this right here. But, you know, he just ripped through 15 minutes, flawless analysis, 
you know, he did everything from the marketing creative side to the numerical side, and he just tore it apart. And literally, like, we all, you know, a couple of us were like, okay, you know, right after this, we'll go to the registrars, we'll get our money back, we'll be all good. Uh, but, um, you know, but it just really showed the level, and it turned out that his background was in consumer products, and that's why gotcha. he nailed it so well, but that's what it was. It was a collection of people that all had, already had experience, and in some cases, significant experience in certain areas, and uh, you basically were in a classroom with a set of experts. They were all expert in something. So you, you know, you're just learning, uh, just unbelievable learning on a daily basis from the professors and also from your classmates. But what was most important about that experience for me was just the relationships. So to this day, 80 people in my section, I could call any one of them with anything, ask really? them to do anything. It's just a very close-knit group. Uh, when, when I left business school, we actually ran the magazine full time and we raised some money. One of our investors was a section mate who gave us some of the capital we needed to start the magazine. So the relationships there were worth the uh, tuition, basically. Whatever became of the magazine? So the magazine, when I uh, graduated uh, from business school, we went and uh, launched the magazine. Um, and um, um, we, uh, I, I say that when you're doing something entrepreneurial, I'm sure you've had this experience, you somehow lose your hearing, right? So we were in like meeting at the meeting and everybody was like, don't do it. This is a horrible <laughs> idea. Like we would go into meetings that were like horrible and we'd come out like, that was a pretty good meeting, right? I think they like the idea. I think they like the idea, right? So uh, yeah, so we would come out and meet like everybody was like, don't do it. So we just ignored all of that. And then we said we had a goal of, uh, you know, if we raise $750,000, we'll do it full time. And, but if we don't, we both had consulting offers. If we don't, we'll go take our consulting jobs. Uh, so we raised like 75000 and still decided to do it. Uh, one of our investors, again, another kind of one of these stories that um, uh, just now is meaningful. At the time, you know, we didn't know how meaningful it would be. But one of our investors was Robert Kraft. Not really. Current owner of the New England mm -hmm. Patriots. So a class, his son was a classmate of ours. And again, how things happen and just networking and relationships. We were, I was on a plane going to do some fundraising and Jonathan Kraft was on a plane. And he said, hey, I, you know, we recognize each other from school. And he's like, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to raise money. I have this magazine, pitch them the whole thing. He's like, oh, I think my mom may like that. He says, why don't you come meet my, me, my mom and my dad, you know, come meet us and we'll see what happens. I had no idea who Robert Kraft was. At the time, he didn't own the Patriots, but he owned a big uh, paper company. Um, so anyway, we met him. I thought this is what life was going to be like mm -hmm. because we met him about an hour meeting. He wrote a check and said, tell me what I get for this. Good luck. And we walked out and we had <laughs> an investment. So I was like, this is what life is going to be like now? You know, never happened again. But uh, that's, how, that's how we raised capital. And um, we, we launched it. Um, well, we were already running it and we uh, started doing it full time. We moved to Baltimore. And then after about a year, just long story short, after about a year, we sold it to another company in Baltimore. Uh, Keith Klingscales, my partner, stayed with the magazine, and I uh, went off to move back to Boston to work at a Bain & Company. So that's not bad, Derek. Um, your first entrepreneurial um, time up at bat, you actually sold the company. That, that's really great. You know, most people don't have that experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that sale was more of a break-even sale. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we, you know, we got our money back. But actually, prior to that, was um, something that was really successful that helped us launch the magazine, which is we launched. Uh, well, at Harvard, there's a student handbook, which um, is a concession awarded to a group that wins a business plan competition. So myself and Keith, who Keith and I went to school together, uh, we um, competed for that concession. And we won that concession. Uh, and what we did was, this was a handbook that basically told you the ins and outs of Harvard Business School, you know, told you the shops to go to, the restaurants, and so on and so forth. So you know, we're trying to figure out, well, how do we make the most money out of this handbook as we can? And whereas most years, there were like there would be the local restaurant ad, and it would be this um, you know, ad for this recruiting, Goldman Sachs recruiting ad. We were like, wait, this is going to uh, 800 entering Harvard Business School students. You know, like consumer products would be interested in reaching this group. 
So we expanded the, the advertising network to jewelry companies, car companies. So that year, the book was like, whereas in, in the past it would have been 70% content, 30% ads. Ours was like 50% content, 50% ads. And we netted like six figures profit from that book alone. Um, so the year, the next year, I felt bad for the people from the next year because based on what we did, they put a cap on the advertising oh, yeah. you put in the book. <laughs> but that, that, that money helped us also with our launch of Urban Profile. Oh, nice. Congratulations. Congratulations. How do you go from being an entrepreneur to segueing into the entertainment industry? Okay. So uh, roll forward. I worked at Bain & Company Management Consulting Firm mm -hmm. for five years uh, in Boston. I uh, had a lot of different clients. Uh, one of my clients was a music retailer, Camelot Music. Um, at the time, um, this was when music was just starting to be sold in like the Walmarts of the world and the Best Buys were being launched. So there was all this new competition. Uh, so they were really trying to figure out their, uh, what their options were. Uh, and at the time, you know, they were losing so much market share and their sales were declining that we helped them do a merger with uh, Musicland, which was another music retailer. But uh, that's just to say I learned a lot about the music business from the retail perspective. Uh, and right around that time, just randomly, I got a call from a recruiter uh, that, that um, uh, offered me to come interview at a job at Bertelsmann Music Group. Uh, BMG. Which, BMG, mm -hmm. which is one of the largest music companies in the world. Uh, they own RCA Records, Arista Records, mm -hmm. uh, Jive Records at the time. And um, I didn't know that I necessarily wanted to be in the music business long term, but I had a business idea, again, a uh, business retail idea, um, which um, based on my experience with Camelot Music, the idea was about selling digital music in stores. Now this is really at the beginning of digital music. So um, long, just to cut long story short, so I had that business plan in my bag. I was actually working with Keith again because he was running Vibe. Mm -hmm. So we were going to do a Vibe branded digital music store. <laughs> was the whole was the whole idea. Uh, and uh, so I was like, hey, this music company, BMG, this could be a good experience to learn more about other aspects of the music business. I can keep working on my plan and go work at BMG. So I took a job at BMG as the vice president of worldwide finance, uh, reported to the chief financial officer of BMG, BMG Music. And that's really how I started uh, in the uh, music business. Did you ever get to pitch your idea to them about the digital music? I never pitched my idea to them, but we did. Because um, you were it. way ahead of the curve. We were maybe a little too far ahead because people, you know, a lot of people thought it was too early. Mm -hmm. But we did. Uh, we did have a few potential backers for that. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up getting pretty close to launching it, but we never launched it. How long are you at BMG now? So I worked at BMG for three years. You worked at BMG for three years. Yes. How does your life segue into Diddy Land? Okay, so the connection, <laughs> if there's any, oh, well, BMG owned Arista Records, mm -hmm. which at the time owned 50% of Bad Boy Records. Yep. So I remember part of my role of being invi uh, vice president of Worldwide Finance was I would go to the parent company, Bertelsmann, which was in Gutersloh, Germany. <laughs> and it's like just the opposite of what you would think a company that owns creative companies or music companies in America would be like. Germany is like, literally, there are, uh, you walk through the hallways and everything is sealed off. Like there's no interaction between people. <laughs> so everyone's in like these sealed offices. It's like you almost feel like you're in jail or something. And it's just crazy. So. We used to go out there and do like quarterly reviews with them. And uh, so I remember one, one of the reviews, it was just I, I, when I flashed back before I ever knew I would go work at Bad Boy, I remember uh, when um, uh, they first did the first really big deal with Puff. It was like a $40 million deal. And I remember them discussing it. And they were like, who's this poof, poof, <laughs> poofy, poof daddy? Like, why are we doing this deal? This is so much money and da 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 and like, And it was just interesting to show you just, you know, uh, how, how, how culture can maybe not translate and can almost be at risk, right? Because I was the only one in the room who even knew who he was. Really? Yeah, because they were all like, yeah, I think he sold some records. I don't know. And I was like, no, this is who he is. Bob, 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 bob. 
he's, you know, the next big thing in the U.S. on the hip hop scene, da da da. You know, so I was able to clarify <laughs> who he was and why this big check was going out to him. Uh, but roll forward, um, Puff was looking for a CFO. He does what he does quite often. He put the word out to his financial uh, community. Uh, and uh, at the time, I also had met Andre Harrell through some other connections. But um, so he, um, one of Andre's good friends, Tracy Maitland, who's a friend of uh, Puff's, um, he put the word out to Tracy. Uh, and uh, Tracy spoke to his wife, uh, Kim Hatchett, who uh, was a year behind me in business school. And Kim's like, well, the only person I know in the music business is Derek Ferguson, he works at BMG. So I got a call from Tracy, I didn't know him at the time. I'd met Andre, so he's like, you know, I'm good friends with Andre, da da, you know, uh, you know uh, Puff is looking for a CFO, would you be interested in interviewing? And I said, yes. Uh, <laughs> We went through a long uh, kind of process, six months of going back and forth, him calling me from the stage at Madison Square Garden, <laughs> like, Playboy, Playboy, we're gonna do this? What are we doing? Uh, you know, like, you, you can identify with that, but eventually, six months later, I uh, agreed to come on board. What was your first impression of Huff? Well, first was, well, my, actually inter my actual interview with him was pretty amazing because um, this was like the heyday of Bad Boys. So, in 1997, just to put it in context, I think of the 52 weeks, Bad Boy, a Bad Boy or a Sean Combs produced song had the number one record for like 30 out of 52 weeks. So it, he was just hot as ever. On fire. Of, of course, coming off uh, the death of Notorious B.I.G. in 97, 98 was, you know, just everything was platinum. So, you know, he was super busy. So we do the interview. Um, we're at a hotel room. I'm at like kind of a... Uh, kind of a dining room, kitchen table type of thing, and he's looking at my resume, and he asked me a question, I forgot what it was, and then the phone rang, and he picked up the phone and started talking, right? So I stopped, I was like, okay, he's not listening, so I'm gonna stop, he's like, okay, keep going, right? So, <laughs> so I'm like talking, and I'm like, there's no way he's hearing me, right? And then he gets off the phone, and he repeats back like three things I said, so I was like, oh, this guy is the king of multitaskers, I can see that right off the bat. Uh, but no, I mean, I think um, I you know, had already been following him, right? And I knew uh, his success. Um, and so I was already a fan in a lot of ways. Um, and everything I saw about him just confirmed what I, what I believed, that he was a great entrepreneur, that he had great instincts, uh, that he was a great, uh, you know, businessman and just really a rare one-of-a-kind type of human being. You are older than him by a couple of years, correct? Yes. At what point did you realize in, in the world of entrepreneurship, you know, you can hit it out the park once and never do it again, or you can work your whole life and at the end of your life, you finally hit it out the park. This guy has had consecutive, like he, at one time he's batting a thousand. At what time did, at what point in, the, in your experience with him did you realize this is not an accident? This is not, you know, just someone who is randomly th throwing things at the wall hoping that they'll stick. This is somebody who's special. Yeah. <clears throat> there are a lot of genius decisions he made. Uh, one of them was his decision to get into apparel. Uh, when I joined Bad Boy in 1998, uh, that was the beginning of the decline in sales of the record business. That was, as we talked about, that was when new technologies were entering into the picture. Digital music was entering into the picture. And you know, literally starting in 99 and 2000, you just saw sales starting to go like this. So uh, had he not made the move to decide to get into uh, the apparel business, um, overall his empire would have, would have suffered. Uh, going from making significant profits in music, um, as that started declining, apparel really picked it right up. So not only was there uh, an experience that most people don't have, which is as you said, most people are fortunate to see one business go from an idea to hundreds of people to hundreds of millions of dollars in sales, you know, see that one time. You know, you know from our experience, we saw that like four times. 
right? Literally, like, you know, just ideas scratched. Um, when I first joined Bad Boy, Jeff Tweedy was just scratching designs, mm -hmm. showing John designs, you know, at his desk. And he was mad because he was sitting in the cubicle. And I knew Jeff from before, and Jeff was like, yeah, you just wait. When we launch this brand, I'm getting the biggest office. You guys got me sitting in the cubicle. And he was mad because he would get his samples, hats and T-shirts. And this is when he said, I knew I had a brand because he didn't have an office, so he'd put them at his desk, and they were all gone by the next day because people were taking them. So, uh, so anyway, that was like literally seeing that go from an idea to a real business. But what the apparel business did for him, which others didn't have, is that as that record... Uh, profitability was going down, he was, he was running a, an extremely profitable apparel business and really a one-of-a-kind type of launch of that business. So that launch, I mean, it was definitely a time where I, it was hard to fathom anything he did not being successful. Like, it just was kind of like you didn't even factor it in like you would in a normal business because everything he was touching was, was gold. Yeah, many people don't realize, you know, at that time, this, and it was a really special time to be on the front lines of seeing business after business, like you said, go from concept to hundreds of employees and hundreds of millions of dollars, it, it, you know. But I love that you said Jeff Tweedy, and for anybody who doesn't know who Jeff Tweedy is, he's the president of Sean John. Most companies start the same. He was literally, I remember seeing Jeff Tweedy in a cubicle, you know, <laughs> as big as Sean John had become. Yes. At one point, it's a $400 million company or something. This man started in a cubicle. Absolutely. So for anybody who is, you know, have these lofty dreams, you have to start somewhere. Yes. And um, more times than not, it's going to be from humble beginnings. Absolutely. And I'll say something else because a lot of people don't understand this. Um, most of the businesses we launched took about two years to plan and develop. Um, and people don't really understand that. I mean, there are, uh, there, are, uh, there are approaches to business that I think are short-term oriented, which is just that I'm going to be reactionary. Anything that comes on my desk, I'm just going to do it, get a quick check, and then it may or may not last. Everything uh, Sean did with Bad Boy and Combs Enterprises was really built to last for a long time. Like I remember even just recently, you know, celebrating 10 years, 20 years, he's always like, why are we celebrating that? That's not a long time. Like I want to celebrate 100 years, mm -hmm. 50 years, 100 years. So, but those things to plan them right take years to plan. Absolutely. And, you know, because I want to talk about the planning and, and strategy that goes into building businesses. But one of the things that I've always admired about you personally you worked in entertainment and you worked at the pinnacle of one of the most successful business entrepreneurs in Sean Diddy Comb. Obviously, his life is very fast paced. He is a man of the nightlife, um, the king of celebration. But you have remained the same person without compromising your integrity or your ethics you know, since the time I've met you, how have you been managed to, how have you managed to do that? Because so many people are lured into the music industry or entertainment and somewhere along the lines, you know, they compromise who they are. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Uh, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> just to be clear, you know, I'm, I'm, and, and, and uh, Sean and I have had a lot of good conversations about faith and I strive to be all the things you said. Uh, definitely not perfect, <laughs> but I do strive. And I think it's really about my, my faith first and just, um, I think at a certain point, and you know, I, I grew up in church, but at a certain point I realized that there's more uh, that God wants out of us than to just kind of, you know, kind of coast through this life that he really does have a purpose for us. Mm -hmm. And if that we're not living on purpose and striving to do things a certain way, you're never going to discover your purpose. So it's almost like if God designed you to be on this road over here, but you always stay on this road, like you're never going to know what he had, you know, what his purpose for you was. So most of us and myself, you kind of at least hoping that you're going to be on and off the road, right? And try to stay on the road as much as you can. But if you just decide, well, I'm just going to ignore all of that, ignore everything about, you know, what 
you know, what the word says about obedience and, and, and all of the direction that's given to you, and I'm just going to stay over here, then you just might as well know for sure that you're never going to find the path to the purpose that God had for you. So that's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, it was interesting for me because joining a bad boy, you know, I was a business person. I went to Harvard Business School. So I'm thinking about, I want to make this the biggest African-American owned business ever, right? Like that's part of my goal. And I started meeting, uh, you know, just all of the very successful people like obviously Puff and Russell Simmons and Benny Medina and all of these very successful people. And, um, you know, I saw like just their hunger and, you know, and their, their desire to be the best and to be the most profitable and to make the most money. And I had to realize for myself that I can definitely support that dream, but that was never going to be that important to me. I was kind of creating that in my head as something important because it's what all my peers were talking about. So other things were just always going to be more important to me, like, you know, my family, my faith life, my friends. So at a certain point, I just had to decide that for myself. And I think when you make that decision, you, can, you make choices differently. So is that something that you came to, a, a, a fork in the road, or did something happen for you to, to, to say, you know what, what's most important to me is not the dollar, it's not the people who I'm associated with, not the people who know my name. Did something happen? I think it was just a faith journey. Okay. And a faith journey that, you know, one is, it's very humbling um, when you really, you know, you know, when you really start that faith journey, right? It's just humbling, right? Because one, I know I just always feel like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, right? It's just a constant, you know, struggle to say, and that's part of the, like, I think the journey of it is just like, if you're not feeling that to me, I feel like you're not on that journey. Uh, and I realized just that anywhere, you know, what I read when I was reading the Bible or studying or whatever, really had nothing to do with your own personal success, really. Like, you know, the people that, you know, preach that and so on, I think are just, it's just inaccurate. It's really about what are you doing for others? What are you doing for the least of these? Uh, so if you don't have that at least somewhere in what you're trying to achieve, I'm not saying you can't go, you know, have a great successful career and so on and so forth, but somewhere in what your goals are in life, if you're, if you're saying you want to follow the Christian walk, it's about doing, doing something for others. That's amazing, Derek, you know, and, that's a, and it's a wonderful way to live your life. Um, but, <laughs> you know, you're a businessman, right? And you worked many years for a, a shark. You know, Puff is known for his business acumen. What's your thoughts? Because we all have heard stories, some of the artists have come out, oh, I got a raw deal, you know, I want out of this contract. You know, Puff, he, he's not a stranger to controversy. Where, what is your stance, and I'm just curious, what's your stance on people who sign a contract, they know what they're signing, they have legal representation, but they'll come out after they're now celebrities and argue that this is a bad contract. And this goes across, this is not just at Bad Boy, it, you know, in the music as an industry as a whole. You know, Prince wore the word slave on his face. Every artist, Kanye West said he, <clears throat> was a slave to his label. What's yeah. your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, well, I'll talk about the music industry and I'll talk about Puff. Uh, I'll talk about Puff first. And he clearly was, even in, e even in uh, uh, the midst of, you know, record labels having to sign artists and having to be contract, he was very artist friendly and favorable. Artists may never <laughs> believe that, but you know from being around, let's do the third yep. video. Yep. Let's do the fourth video. No one was doing that, you know, and no one really knew times when he was going into his own pocket to do things. Uh, so in the scheme of the music business, if there's a spectrum, he's way over here in terms of being artist friendly. Now that doesn't always feel good to the artist because it still may mean that, you know, something doesn't work out or it doesn't go as well for them as they would like. Um, but that is clear. I mean, from my being at BMG Music, seeing every, seeing 60 worldwide record labels and how they operate while I was there, and then watching how Sean Combs and Bad Boy operated, he was definitely artist friendly um, and, and, and favorable to the artists compared to the music industry. 
Now the music industry is based on a very simple principle which I think we need to think about uh, going forward which is that I want to have as much ownership as as much as I can uh, and I want as much of the economics as I can negotiate right I mean that's that's, that's ultimately what it is and um, one of the things I've been talking about a lot is just that <clears throat> I feel like hip-hop missed a very unique opportunity right we missed an opportunity to own our own value the right way um, and I you know easy visual way to think about it is that you know if you think about the movie Black Panther and, and, and uh, <clears throat> you know um, um, you, you think about the um, what was the, 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 the metal or whatever that they had oh, uh, um, vibranium, vibranium. There yeah. we go. There <laughs> think we about go. the vibranium mm -hmm. hip-hop really was the vibranium mm -hmm. right it was that value that our communities created that people created and Basically, what we allowed to happen was, was for the industry to divide and conquer. So let me pull this group over here, let me pull this group over here, let me give millions here, millions there, millions there, and then I'm going to take the 90% and everyone else gets the 10%, generally, right? And so we, you end up having this great natural resource, vibranium, and you're watching other people building great statues with it, and you're left with like 10% of it. And 90% is over here somewhere building fortunes and foundations. Whereas had we thought more collectively, right, we would have said basically this is our natural resource. You're going to buy in at the right price. Everyone's got to buy in through this collective. And you've got to buy in at the right price. And by the way, you can only buy in. You can't really own it. Right? If you want to own it, that's a whole other conversation. And imagine if that ownership had been retained, if that natural resource had been re retained, and you know we built value through that so all of that is to say is that the industry is designed as most industries are it's like this is their raw material this is their product mm -hmm. right so it's just as i would try to go make this water bottle for as little as possible and make this you know so that i can sell it for as high as possible and make as much money as possible same thing with an artist i want to sign that artist pay that artist for whatever I can, you know, w w the least amount possible, own as much as possible, uh, and make as much profit as possible. So you really do look at it as, at the end, it's, it's business. You get what you negotiate? I, I believe so. I do believe, though, there's, you know, we have to, we can't look at this without the lens of society and systemic um, people taking advantage of others systemically, mm -hmm. right? And... Uh, so you can't look at it without that lens because you go back to the artists of the 50s and 60s and you see how basically a lot of black artists were, you know, hoodwinked or whatever, Correct. right? So you can't look at it without that lens. So I would say yes, but, yes, but it was also exploitive in certain situations and, and it was allowed to be exploitive because people did not have the power or the knowledge or the ability to really um, come to the table the right way, right? Anybody who came to the table the right way was an anomaly. If you come to the table the right way and you just decide, I want to take this hundred grand, I want to sell you my masters forever, I want to take 8% going forward, if you come to the table the right way, that's just a decision you made. But if you don't come to the table the right way, and we, and, and industry and people that are known to have all, you be exploitive, of, uh, of, uh, of a race or, or, or people that are living in poverty, then you know, that, you, I can't simply say it's just business because it's also, in some cases, exploitive. Got you. You are a man behind so many you know, really big deals, um, one of which, and just segueing from your role at Bad Boy to Revolt, um, talk to me about how Revolt came to be in the relationship with Comcast. Very interesting. So, um, Revolt actually, the idea of doing a cable network really came from uh, Sean's massive success that he had with the um, Making the Band brand on MTV and all of his TV shows. Um, so at one point, he was the highest paid producer of MTV VH1 shows. And, you know, very, the way, um, the way Sean tends to look at everything. He's like, if they're paying me this much, how much are they making, <laughs> right? Uh, and we started thinking about the idea of 
what it would take to actually start a cable network. Uh, the first plan we put together actually, actually was right before the big market crash. And that was a plan um, which um, we he had several partners and uh, devised a whole business plan, a whole uh, reel around what the channel would be, went and pitched it to Comcast. We're ha we were having really good meetings. Uh, and then the market just crashed and everybody, um, you know, everybody just did nothing, right? They just waited to see what was going to happen. Uh, but a couple of years later, uh, Comcast uh, bought uh, NBC Universal, uh, and in that acquisition, they were mandated by Congress to add more minority-owned channels to the okay. network. So we caught wind of that, and we decided to uh, really enter into a bake-off. This was like <laughs> everybody in the world was in this bake-off, from Bob Johnson to Bill Cosby to everybody in TV world was in this bake-off. Uh, we entered into this bake-off, and this is one of those cases where we literally, uh, we hired Andy Schoen, mm -hmm. uh, who was one of the early um, producers at MTV, uh, and he had a good relationship with Sean, and we literally um, took, first, you know, sat with Puff and got his vision, which was like 20 pages of vision about what he wanted it to be, and he basically said, I want to bring back the old school music channel. Like, I think it's time now. We've corrected enough and it's time to have like MTV. At that time, MTV was not playing any music. Mm -hmm. It's time to have music on TV again. A uh, lot of people objecting to it. No way. Music is digital now. That's never going to work. He persisted with his vision. Uh, and then we just laid out a game plan. So this was again something where you, you literally laid out step by step what's the channel going to be, what are the shows going to be, what are the economics going to look like. Uh, we went and pitched Comcast. We were actually the last group to pitch. And we were one out of like about 80 groups. We were one of two groups picked uh, by Comcast uh, wow. to be added to the Comcast network. And from there, we added Time Warner and we added other distribution as well. You know, I, I want to bring something to life because y you, you again reiterate the planning and really doing the due diligence behind the scenes before you ever even make the pitch, before any idea comes to life. And I think it's important for people who are in the audience and also people who are gonna be watching this um, online to understand you, anybody can have a great idea. You know, everybody has a great idea. But the ideas that tend to make it and have longevity and when ultimately are the ones that while you're sleeping, we are planning, we are trying to poke holes in these ideas and we are strategizing so that when we do pitch it, we're bulletproof pretty much. Would you say? Absolutely, I think um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna butcher this quote, but uh, <laughs> Diddy has a quote which is something like, close your eyes and dream and then wake up, then wake up, open your eyes and see, mm -hmm. right? So a dream without a plan is just a dream. And that's like the mantra. You gotta have the dream and the vision and that's great, and there's some people that have that, you know, have that gift, and, and Sean Combs is one of those people, but then you have to have the plan to execute it. And I think a lot of people just think, I have this dream, and I'm gonna make it work, and I'm just gonna be, I'm gonna work, work hard, and make it work, but you don't have the plan. You haven't assessed the landscape. I, I think to really simplify business, it's kinda, I, I, I like to try to break it down to a lemonade stand mentality. I got five lemonade stands in a neighborhood. What's gonna make mine stand out? Why does mine need to exist? Right, am I gonna be lower price? Am I gonna have better flavors? Am I gonna be in a better location? Like, why do I need to exist? So when you're starting a business, if you, you have to start with that premise. What, what am I fulfilling, what am I filling here that's a void? What's the white space? And how am I going to be better than other people in that space? And that sometimes is a very long process, and you really want to know the landscape as it is now and what it will be in the coming future. So sometimes it's not even your current competition, but it's your, your competition that's coming that's not even there yet that you really need to understand. So uh, yeah, there's no way to dream without a plan um, because you'll, you'll fail, basically. Um, and, and maybe this goes back to, you know, you just being a numbers person because as long as I've known you and just even hearing you speak, you're very analytical. 
you know, planning and really making sure that, that your product is different from the others that um, are currently in existence and will come in exi into existence. Is it ever been a problem with you, for you, with overanalyzing? Can that be, you know, just as detrimental to an uh, 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 upstart entrepreneur as not planning? Yeah, I think what I learned really uh, from working at Bad Boy and working with Puff is, uh, you know, analysis plus instinct. He's like the greatest in the world I've ever seen with instinct. So, but you need the analysis to set, to set the, the benchmark, to set the range, right? So oftentimes I would go and do the analysis, all the traditional stuff. So anybody out there that's, you know, taking finance classes or whatever, like the projection models, I could do all of that figure out what the value of something is, uh, and then, you know, come present it to them, like, okay, this is worth $15 million. You know, if you get that, you know, you're, you know you've, you've done well if, if, you, if you get that price for it. I'm just, whatever, whatever it is, making it up. But we're like, when he gets in the room, he literally reads the room and reads people. So he may just decide in that room that, nah, I'm gonna get more than 15 million, <laughs> right? And, and it will just happen, it's like an audible, right there so when they're like so when we're in the room we're negotiating and it gets to 15 million and i'm like good we're there we got it like i'm ready like i'm ready like raise my hand like we're ready he's like uh no nah, i don't yeah i don't think you guys are serious about this you know so i stopped wasting your time because you guys aren't you know you're not really serious but i'm like kicking them under the table like did you hear what he said that's the number right and he would sit there and honestly most in most cases he'd get that bigger number so that really made all of my analysis <laughs> look faulty because he's like, well, look, I just got five million more, right? But, I, but it really was, the analysis still said that was too much. But I think you start with that as, you know, so you have your parameters of what you're doing and then you let, you know, where you have great instinct, you let instinct, uh, you know, play its role as well. That's an excellent point, Derek. Excellent. What, what was your role at Revolt? So at Revolt, um, I started out just as a uh, really a uh, board member, okay. one of the founding board members, uh, helped launch it, negotiated the first deal with Comcast, helped raise the capital, uh, and then um, as, uh, as needs arise, I went in and I was the interim CFO for a while, interim chief operating officer, and then I ended up being, uh, spending my full time as a chief operating officer there uh, for about two years. For anybody who doesn't know what a chief operating officer's role is, can you simplify that? So a chief operating officer um, really, it can work several ways. Uh, and at a minimum, it, it usually runs all of the operational aspects of a business. So in the case of a cable business, that would be the finance operation. That would be the production operation, actual productions. That would be legal. Um, that would be, you know, finance and accounting. That would be um, um, uh, um, production. Uh, this production and is also production management. Um, and then, and then it depends on what your CEO wants, because then, you know, COO is basically basically like the number two to a CEO. So mm -hmm. depending on what the CEO wants, if they if they want less direct reports and want to be more external. They may add other, uh, other functions to, to report into their COO. So, uh, you know, at one point at Revolt, when there wasn't a CEO, all of the functions from advertising sales to uh, distribution um, to um, creative all reported into me. So, but it just depends how a CEO wants to structure it. Uh, at a minimum, it's all of the operational areas. At a maximum, it could be really any set of direct reports that the CEO feels comfortable and confident that you could oversee. Coming from more of the finance side, did you enjoy the, the, the operations side a bit more? Uh, well, it gives you a broader perspective. It, it really, so I would say at Bad Boy for years, I was a chief financial officer but there wasn't a chief operating officer. So I did a lot of the things that would fall under a chief operating officer uh, anyway. Um, but you know, for me, the chief operating officer role allows you to be more strategic. 
in some cases, allowed you to see more parts of the business in depth. Um, but honestly, when you're talking about the size businesses that we were involved in, and you're talking about startups, you pretty much are doing you're everything anyway, heads. and mm -hmm. you have to know about everything anyway. So uh, I don't think there was a big difference in the functions uh, practically. Were you involved in the deal with AT&T, helping to bring AT&T on board, and um, now what's known as the Revolt Summit? Because, and, one, and the reason I'm asking this is because AT&T, you know, everybody knows the company, but it seems as though they have taken interest in the African American and brown consumer. And um, you were right there on the front line of, of doing that deal. So what was your role in, in helping to secure that deal? And what was their interest in getting involved with, obviously, a Sean Combs and Revolt? Yeah, well, let's be clear. When we say AT&T now, we say AT&T, DirecTV, Warner Studios. So, I mean, that means they own HBO, CNN. Wow. They own DirecTV, which everyone knows about. You know, so, so they are a huge conglomerate. And I think uh, they're squarely in the content space now. So I think they, they've tried to forge partnerships with many groups that can, provide, can help them uh, per, you know, help them build their content uh, uh, and, and help to feed this whole system, which is now starts from really the creative all the way to the distribution. Uh, so they're like a, an incredible conglomerate as they're constructed now. Uh, I was at the beginnings of the AT&T um, uh, deal, mm -hmm. which was really, first it was the uh, AT&T had its own uh, distribution platform which was AT&T U-verse, um, and that was about five million homes. Uh, and then uh, AT&T acquired DirecTV, so they kind of phased out AT&T U-verse and phased it into DirecTV. Um, and then ultimately, uh, they you know moved into. Uh, they also acquired Warner and, and 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 continued there. So I was at the beginnings of the relationship. I still am on the revolt board so i've seen the growth of the relationship through my board relationship but this is you know i will say i will say you know there have been businesses that are tough the cable business at the time we got involved in the cable business was probably the toughest business really uh yeah i uh i experienced they were it was tough slash disrespectful <laughs> you in know which way <laughs> like just like, hey, we're bringing you this great audience. You don't have this audience. You don't really know anything about this audience. We got this, we got that. We're bringing you all this value. And they're like, I don't really, I don't really need it. And I don't really, I don't really care about that audience. <laughs> you wow. know? So you, I mean, like, it was, I mean, it's just notoriously tough. But we caught it at a time when they were trying to contract and trying to drop networks. So it was even tougher. So, uh, you know, you know, that was uh, the way to get things done. I, I, really, I really saw where we are, going back to the vibranium example I gave earlier, mm -hmm. I really saw where we are as a community and where we were on the power spectrum, mm -hmm. which was we had to go back to the same, you know, we had, had to go back to some of the same tools we used 30, 40, 50 years ago, which was to uh, demonstrate some community power and some community influence to say, hey, if you don't treat us right, you know, you're gonna have to hear from this community. Uh, and to me, we had a great business proposition, so it really shouldn't have gotten to that, but quite often, it got to that conversation. Um, and uh, so it was tough, very tough uh, place. I do commend AT&T for really being a great partner mm -hmm. and seeing the value of the business proposition, but you know, you know, there are many carriers that just still, you know, um, making it really difficult. Um, we're not the only ones, but <laughs> I think, uh, you know, we're, when you look at the lack of penetration of minority and women-owned content, uh, I just felt like we shouldn't have had to battle the way we battled. At, at the time that, that you guys actually were awarded um, Revolt. Wasn't the Magic Johnson uh, awarded a network at the same, it was about four, four different. Um, right. 
So there were two African American owned, two uh, Hispanic owned channels, mm -hmm. and uh, Magic was the other African American owned channel, uh, and there were two Hispanic channels awarded at that at that time. Yes. Are any of them still in existence? Do you know? Uh, up. Uh, what, what was uh, um, uh, Aspire still exists? Still exists. Um, that's Magic Johnson's Magic channel. Mm -hmm. I think all of them still exist. Yeah. Okay. Let's fast forward. Let's um, go to Robin Hood. Yes. And your role at Robin Hood, COO. Um, we spoke about operations. What does your day to day look like? So my day to day is, um, uh, you know, right now we're really going through a strategic uh, plan process. Uh, so one of the things, uh, uh, so to rewind, so June of 2017, Westmore took the helm at Robin Hood. I'd known Wes for about 10 years. Wes Moore, for uh, uh, people that don't uh, recognize the name right offhand, is a famous author. He wrote the book, The Other Wes Moore. He became uh, you know, a featured um, speaker in the Democratic Party, so he spoke at uh, the second Obama inaugur inauguration, I mean, uh, the Democratic National Convention, uh, and just became a political and social figure, a figure for social justice um, and a political figure um, and uh, you know stood for really uh, doing things to um, correct some of the systemic issues that were affecting uh, urban communities. Um, so Wes called me and he just was like hey I'm about to take this job at Robin Hood. I'm thinking about it differently and I'm thinking about hiring a, you know, a different type of COO, someone who's seen you know the industry seen industry instead of coming from the nonprofit world and he had a whole vision about what he wanted to do his part of his vision was that uh robin hood is a is a great organization of philanthropy but really had only dipped its toe in the water in public policy mm -hmm. and his view was that we needed to add public policy to the mix of toolkit we used and basically his fundamental view was that Philanthropy shouldn't be just about charity, it should be about change and changing systems. So really a big part of my first couple of years there has been about uh, working on a strategic plan to uh, adjust the focus uh, of Robin Hood from being, you know, just has been a great uh, poverty fighting organization, but to more specifically think about how do we deal with systemic issues and how do we deal with sustainably uh, moving households out of poverty? So how do we correct some of these things that are going wrong and then measure ourselves on how we're doing? And it's a big, big task and there's a lot of obstacles. Uh, I'd say the, 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 the greatest thing uh, I discovered upon joining Robin Hood was how every problem I was aware of was more difficult than- Elaborate. Uh, so, Start with education. Mm -hmm. So one of the things uh, I did when I was with uh, Puff was I worked with him to launch a charter school. Uh, we have uh, Capital Prep in Harlem, I'm chairman of the board of that. We're opening Capital Prep Bronx in 2020. Um, and uh, you know I knew we had some issues in our educational system, but Capital Prep starts in the sixth grade. And for three years in a row, we get about 80 to 100 sixth graders. And for three years in a row, under 10% of the children we get coming in from the fifth grade to the sixth grade through a random lot lottery, under 10% were proficient in math. Wow. And under 30% were, prof were proficient in English. So if you're, if you're getting to the sixth grade and you're not proficient at the levels of 70 to 90%, you know, the, the hope for you you know, is, is, is greatly diminished, right? So capital prep, part of the model is about how do you catch kids up? But like that type of deficit that people are facing at that point in their educational, um, you know, uh, in their education to me was just way more significant than I, than I thought. Um, we have so many issues in the educational system. Um, there are, so first of New York City, I can go on and on about this, so cut me off. Yeah. <laughs> New York City has a million kids in the educational system, largest educational system in the country, as you can imagine. Uh, it's the most segregated education system in the country. Uh, 100,000 students in the New York City educational system are in temporary housing. So bouncing around house to house 
oftentimes in shelters, 10%. Um, last year, a stat that just blew me away and, and just depressed me, and I still don't want to believe it, is that in the Bronx overall, 14, only in, in middle school grades, sixth to eighth grade, only 14% of African American boys were uh, on grade level in math. Wow. Uh, so we have some major challenges, and honestly, nothing else can happen without the educational Education. system working for everybody. And you know, you, I told you a little bit about my story. It, you know, where I got to where I got to just strictly through education, strictly through uh, the opportunity uh, to do well in school, and um, and that that's what changed, you know, changed the, the trajectory for, for for my life. And it can, I think, it is another one of those great equalizers. But we're so far behind in offering uh, the average everyday student from certain zip codes the type of education they really deserve and need. It's not the kid's fault, that's the other thing. You show up, you meet the kids. If I went right now and introduced you to 20 kids that are way behind mm -hmm. in the public school system and you met them, you would be like, no way, I don't believe it. They, know, they seem to know a lot, they seem to be knowledgeable, they can they talk, they, you know, talk great, they're smart, uh, they seem competent, but you know, we're just failing them. The system is failing them. You know, you use the word systemic time and time again in this interview. You know, Robin Hood donates roughly over $100 million annually to different causes. What's the fix? You know, where do we, because sitting in your seat and hearing these statistics that you just ran off to us, it's overwhelming. It seems daunting. It seems like there's no hope. You're dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis now. Where do you sit with this and where do you see to solve? Yeah, um, 100 million is a lot of money, uh, which is great, but honestly, um, <clears throat> the money spent uh, in New York City, I mean, the, some of these numbers are like, you know, incredible. We just talked about a system that's basically failing the educational system. That's a $60 billion system. Right, the total dollars that comes into New York City for programs from education to others from federal, state, city, and all philanthropy is $170 billion. But yet the poverty rate stays the same pretty much. Dips and dives a point or two here and there. And, and uh, so, it's, it's, so this, is a, this is a huge problem. Just one point about the poverty rate. At any one point in time, it may be about 20% of people living in New York City are in poverty. But one of the studies we did um, using our own um, proprietary research, the poverty tracker is that over any three year period in New York City, 42% of people are actually in and out of poverty. Wow. So you know, you're talking about half the city that's essentially living in poverty over a three year period. Uh, so we have a significant problem. So how, how do we fix it? Um, you know, one is like, and we have everything going backwards. So while we're, well, we're being distracted by Ukraine and this, that, and the other. Meanwhile, just everything that supports and will help lift up, up, up uh, people that are uh, in the lower income brackets is being dismantled. So, you know, what, what is happening methodically uh, in this administration is all of those support programs that have been known to work uh, are just being dismantled from the SNAP program, which is a, you know, what we knew as the food stamp program mm -hmm. back in the day, uh, the, uh, everything regarding immigration, uh, you know, making it tougher for people on benefits to get citizenship through the public charge rules changing. So meanwhile, they're really uh, systemically, when we talk about systemic, those are things that make things systemically more difficult, right? So I can do, I can, I can do everything right, I can be doing everything right, I can be on track for uh, you know, moving out of poverty, and I just right now, that benefit, that food benefit, is just helping to sustain me as I finish school, or as I do this, or as, I, I, as I, I'm, I'm trading off food for like healthcare, mm -hmm. or food for daycare, right? So now all of a sudden you take that benefit away, and now I gotta make that choice again, because now I gotta figure out how I pay for food. So I probably got to get rid of daycare, which cuts down the hours I can work. So it's just like, you know, and, and the thing is that, you know, 
I, I honestly, um, I'm new in this world, right? So when I join, you know, people that have been in this world for a while would always say systemic, you know, same thing. I'm just saying it and saying, it, okay, oh, there's all these systemic issues. Now, I guess my general reaction is that, hey, we've always had to uh, work twice as hard and we've always ha had to figure out all of the toughest issues. You know, we could figure this out. You know what I mean? Like we could get a collective, collective mind and, you know, just if we could just all work together, we could figure this out. But some things honestly are just systemically unfair, right? So you have to, we have to put a few things together like a tax break here, right? And then take away food benefits here. Like that, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta understand the whole scheme of things where you can, you can literally have people like, you know, I, I, uh, I, uh, I, I can see the future, and when at some point we finally see Donald Trump's taxes, he's gonna have paid zero taxes, whereas all of us in here are paying taxes. So how does that make sense? But that's the system we're in, right? And that is part of the systemic things that are going wrong, but yet, even in that type of system, if you say, okay, I, I, you know, whatever, that tax code, let's say we can make the argument that that's fair, then how do we then justify taking away support from people that need it, right? So you got support with the tax code, you know, so, don't, so we shouldn't think that very wealthy people aren't being supported by government decisions. They are. They're being supported by paying less taxes. They're being supported many ways. So I think that, you know, we have to understand that there's really a history of how this got designed. And, uh, you know, honestly, I, I, you know, I, I heard the solutions I hear that make the most sense are not subtle. You know, the one thing, you know, you got to understand if you're dealing with a system, is you can't really nibble at the edges of the system. You know, you really have to look to dismantle and fully change full systems. I heard a, 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 a guy, African-American uh, gentleman who was a district attorney in Boston, uh, also a pastor, uh, and you know, his job was enforcing the law, and he broke down the history of the justice system, and he says, you know, I am now fully a supporter of abolishing the justice system. Wow. Like, it should just go away. Like, it's a system of punishment, not rehabilitation, and we just need to find another way. And, you know, so some of these things we're going to really have to look at dramatic solutions and dramatic changes. Just in the interest of time, and I wish that we could <laughs> speak, I, I could speak to you all day about this. So I'll ask you a couple more questions. Um, really quickly, in light of everything that you just said, is going to work fulfilling? Is, is, <laughs> was it a burden? Like, how do you come home at night? What do, what do you feel when you leave the office? Yeah, um, <laughs> I've been thinking about this a lot. I think, well, one of the things is that, so I think two important things for me right now is one is, you know, when you get to my age, you start thinking about your life expectancy, right? So I'm like, how many years do I have and what do I want to accomplish in those years? So the first thing for me is really purely stepping into individual accountability. Like, can I wake up every morning knowing we have an educational system that looks like it does and be okay with that? Like, we all individually have to first think about that. And then I think I have to think about, well, I can't fix any of these things alone, so I gotta really figure out how do I take my next number of years and find people that collectively will think alike, either think alike now or we can, we can get to the point of thinking alike so we can really figure out the action. What I think, and this fits so well with, to me, what theology tells us and what a lot of, a lot of things in my life have told me is that we're not meant or able to do anything individually. We're really meant, and the whole part of our test of being on this earth is figuring out how do we corral collective effort around solving problems. And I think part of what has success, successfully done in systems like this in America is um, just fragmenting people. Uh, just, um, you know, keeping people uh, separated uh, in a way that they can't come together, makes it much more difficult 
to come together collectively. Uh, so, you know, I think I will, um, one, embrace that individual accountability and lament in it, because mm -hmm. there's just times where it's just depressing. But, you know, after I get over that depression, figure out what am I going to spearhead collectively to lead some change. That's great, Derek, that's great. Couple of quick questions for you. What's the best advice you ever received? Hmm. Man. So many good, so much good advice I got. Um, I've been really fortunate to have just a lot of uh, great advice from parents to you know other role models. Um, let me see. Man, that's a good question. Um, I'm gonna come back to you on that one. Okay, I don't want to say. I don't want to just say something for the purpose no of saying problem, it. No problem. Let me think about that one. What's the worst advice you ever got? Worst advice I ever got. Well, <laughs> uh, the worst advice I ever got. Um, man. <laughs> Let's see. Worst advice I ever got. Um, Well, I would say one of the things that happened to me early on in my career was um, when I was working. So again, just to shape, I think I framed it, but like I'm in these environments that, that I, I'm, in the, I'm finding myself in these environments that are entirely foreign to me, right? So it's done with University of Pennsylvania, Wharton School, Harvard Business. These are foreign environments. I don't, you know, like I don't know anything about what to do in these environments. I'm learning my way through it. I end up at Bain & Company which is you know, a, a top tier strategic consulting firm. So this is, just to put the framework together, is the top tier of students at the Harvard Business School go to the Bain and Companies, McKinsey and Companies. So at Bain and Company in my first um, year, um, we had a class of eight new consultants and um, I got um, my first review period, I got a really bad review. Um, and um, I, I, really, uh, I really credit this person because they gave me a straightforward, it was as honest, it was blunt. You know what I mean, blunt review. And at the time, you know, he said, well, you're in the bottom 25% of the class. So my math is pretty good. So I, like, I said, am I number seven or <laughs> am I number eight? He said, well, you're not number eight. I said, okay, so I'm number seven. But I'd never seen myself at that part of anything I'd ever been in. Uh, and I think, um, at the time, I just felt like, and this review was very encouraging, but I think at the time, I felt a lot of feedback I was getting was kind of like, well, maybe this isn't for you. Uh, you know, not everybody can be successful at this, and you know, maybe this isn't for you. Whereas I really, um, I didn't know, to be honest, because it was a foreign environment, but I did know I could work harder, and I could follow direction. So I followed a lot of the uh, direction that the reviewer gave me, stuck with it, learned, uh, and ended up sticking it out for five years. And actually, myself and another woman became the uh, first African Americans at Bain & Company to be promoted to manager. So I see that as kind of bucking the trend of kind of giving up where people were kind of leading me to and uh, moving on to be successful. Derek, where's the worst advice in that? <laughs> what question did well, you answer? I think the answer? worst advice were the people that were kind of saying that, yeah, maybe this isn't for you. Like when oh, I was okay. talking to other peers about. I mean, about, I love the know, story. I love the message. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what's the, where's the worst advice. <laughs> Last question okay. for you. I'll try to answer it. No problem. You know, you're at an age, you're very reflective. What advice would you give to your youngest self? Well, I think a couple of things. One is, um, one, I would say start your journey earlier. Um, um, that what we just talked about in terms of what is your plan. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would have just encouraged myself to start it earlier and to uh, map it out step by step, right? And to know that each step of the way um, you have to exceed expectations. And I don't think I had, maybe because I just didn't have the world view, um, 
I didn't know the step after the next step after the next step. And uh, I just think it, if, if I had to do something over, I really would have been, I was very fortunate that I had good choices, but um, I think that I would encourage someone to map out your steps at a much younger age. And to, I tell uh, students in college, you know, like, you know, there's a myth about this is the time to have fun, uh, this is the time, this, you know, whatever, you know, like this is, but th that's really the time. You're going to have the most free time, although, you know, many people work hard in college, you're going to have the most free time to map out your plan in college than you may ever have. Mm -hmm. Right after college, you're going to have to start making money, paying bills, so on and so forth. So that's a good time to start really mapping out your plan. Derek, thanks so much for being Thank here. You. Please give it up for Power Move Maker, Mr. Derek Ferguson. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.